Nourishing the Violent Brain, brought to us by uh, Matushka Christina uh, Veselak. Uh, she uh, hails uh, from Denver, Colorado, uh, and I have uh, already had the pleasure of hearing her share some of her expertise on nutrition uh, as it relates to uh, mental health and addiction. Uh, I think you're going to find this uh, fascinating. Thank you very much. Hi, everyone. I have, I'm a licensed psychotherapist. I've been licensed for over 30 years, working in the addiction field for over 30 years. And I am also a certified nutritionist. And as a nutritionist, I specialize in mental health nutrition and nutrition for addiction recovery. And in the process, I've run across quite a few violent offenders. And I used to actually help run a domestic violence agency. I focused on the female offenders, but I also would sub for the male offenders as well, and you will be hear hearing several stories about this through my presentation. So nourishing the violent brain, and I really wasn't quite sure how to title this. I probably should have titled it something catchier, like what does the brain have to do with it? Because like in all conversations regarding addiction and mental health, these conversations tend to focus on the psychosocial and spiritual aspects of disorders and ignores the brain. Well, just like with violence and mental illness, or just like addiction and mental illness, violence is a bio psychosocial, spiritual disorder driven by the brain. And so if you look at this picture here of a three-legged stool, right? imagine trying to sit on a three-legged stool with only two legs. It, maybe you can balance for a while. If you just sit on one leg, it doesn't topple right over. Okay. If you have two legs in there, say the psychosocial and the spiritual, maybe you can keep your balance for a little while, but as soon as you lose your focus, over you go. To really provide full treatment for a successful recovery from any of these disorders, we need all three legs of the stool. So what causes violence? We know there's the psychosocial piece, there's childhood trauma, learned behavior. If this is you grow up in a neighborhood where, you know, gunfire is very frequent, you're going to learn how to shoot a gun really quickly. If you grow up in a family where somebody is regularly hitting somebody else out of anger or despair or, 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 you're going to learn to hit somebody or something as a way of expressing your anger and frustration. If you grow up in any of these families or neighborhoods, you are not going to learn adequate stress management skills, emotion management skills, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, so all of this is very, very true. Spiritual deficits can cause violence and addiction and mental health issues. In our domestic violence agency where I worked, we saw a lot of entitlement, a lot of, I have the right to have power over you. I have the right to hit you if I'm angry. I have the right to put you down. I'm up here and you're down here, okay? Well, that's a spiritual issue, among other things. Disenfranchisement, not belonging, profoundly not having a place in the world, not feeling like you have a place in your community or in your home, can lead to anger and despair and the need to strike out. Profound fear will lead to the need to strike out and be protective, perhaps. But there's a third piece here, and that's the biochemical piece. And that is an out-of-balance brain. So our brain is our master control panel. All of our feelings, our skills, our ability to utilize willpower to have positive rather than negative cognitions and beliefs, 
our ability to perceive accurately what's happening around us and what's happening inside of us. Even our ability to sleep and to relax, all of this requires an in-balance brain. And if our brain is out of balance, or parts of it are offline, we will not be able to access our stress management skills, our relaxation skills, our communication skills. They'll be gone, no matter how hard we worked to learn them. So an imbalanced life requires an imbalanced brain. And there's a lot of more and more research, actually, that's indicating that to have a effectively spiritual life, we need an imbalanced brain as well, that to live spiritually, to pray, to perceive the presence of God also requires a functioning brain. So what throws our brain off balance? Lots of things. Unstable blood sugar, depleted neurotransmitters, talk about that in a minute, nutrient deficiencies, malnutrition, hormone imbalances, toxins such as heavy metals, or you know, Lyme disease, food allergies and intolerances, genetics, mood-altering chemicals and behaviors, of course, but also things like impaired digestion and an impaired microbiome in our gut. But most of all, a hungry brain. It is our brain's job to allow us to cope with stress gracefully. Isn't that nice? But to do that, it needs to be fed optimally. Our brain actually requires specific nutrients to function. And if it doesn't have those nutrients, it actually cannot function optimally. I want to back up here for a minute, because really what I'm talking about is a new paradigm. Do we need a new paradigm for addressing violence, addiction, and mental illness? And what might be wrong with or the limitations of the old paradigm? Well, in the old paradigm, we have teams of criminal justice professionals, psychologists, psychiatrists, sociologists, special educators, because of course violence can start somebody very, very young, politicians, and you know, gun control, and clergy rack their brains to find the answer. But nobody is asking. Could an out-of-balance brain, could an out-of-whack brain-body connection be part of what's driving these behaviors? And if somebody does ask this question, the answer is, well, let's just put the person on medication. We just need more medication. Well, there's actually some research that's indicating that some of these homicidal shooters we're actually on quite a bit of medication, and that possibly it was the medication itself that was causing the violence. What is not part of the conversation is when was the last time this person ate protein? Has their brain enough nutrients to function adequately? What is actually going on nutrient-wise with these people? So we are asking the wrong questions completely, because as I said, all these other things are real. But if that's the only part of the conversation, we're missing that third leg of the stool. So the new paradigm believes that the body is an interconnected whole. It doesn't separate the brain from the rest of the body. And it doesn't separate behavior and mood from either the brain or the body. It therefore puts the power for change in health back into the hands of the patient or the offender and their family. And it values the entire person, body, mind, and soul in their entire life context. And that's part of what makes it profoundly orthodox because we are incarnated beings. Okay, we're not just our soul. We're not just our brain. We are entire. And therefore, to help somebody move back into order, we need to be addressing body, mind, and spirit, and not separating out any part of it. So the new paradigm believes that psychiatric root causes exist, 
that they can be identified and effectively treated. We're not just addressing the symptoms. We actually believe and know that we can look under the hood, like we do with our car, and find out what's actually going on. And we can effectively treat this and address it, often by using diet, over-the-counter nutrients, and other non-pharmaceutical means. The new paradigm believes that illness and behavioral disorders are multi-causal, and therefore effective solutions are multifactorial. And finally, it believes that for the brain to work optimally, it must be fed optimally. This idea is not new. The orthomolecular psychiatry pioneers, Dr. Abram Hoffer and Dr. Carl Pfeiffer, who we'll see in a minute, started their research in the 50s. They started publishing on this in the 50s. And I think there's research that goes back even before them. So orthomolecular psychiatry, ortho means right, we all know this. Molecular means nutrient. And so these orthomolecular psychiatrists believe that psychiatric behavioral imbalances, behaviors, disorders, are actually due to the lack of the right nutrient in the body and in the brain. And that once you bring in the right nutrient or nutrients, which is usually the case, the body itself knows how to bring itself back into balance. Functional medicine is the name given to the broader approach to not just psychiatry, but also entire health, where it's a personalized systems-oriented model. It empowers patients and practitioners to achieve the highest expression of health by working in collaboration to address the underlying cause of disease. So again, we don't believe that any part of the body is dramatically separate than any other part. And what happens in your gut may impact your brain and mood and behavior, and vice versa. And so we want to approach whole health from as many angles as possible. Abram Hoffer initially started publishing in the 50s. He died in 2009. Carl Pfeiffer, again, started writing in the 50s, and he researched the impact of nutrients in those with chronic mental illness. He died in 1988. But there are several people who have taken up this, this baton and carried it, and they all have wonderful literature. Dr. Roger Williams, who also died in 88, and, but Dr. Jeffrey Bland is still around, and he's really considered the current father of what's called functional medicine, sort of uh, the name given to what used to be alternative and complementary medicine has really now turned into functional medicine because what we want to understand is what's going wrong with the functioning at the deepest molecular level that is leading to symptoms and how can we correct this. The two books here are really my inspiration for this lecture. This is Barbara Stitt, Food and Behavior. She used to be chief parole officer for the state of Ohio. And as she started instituting or encouraging her parolees to start eating properly and avoiding more dangerous foods and nutrient behaviors, she ended up with a 0% recidivism rate, which is very, very amazing. And so she wrote this book to explain how and why what she did and what she had her clients do work. Dr. Adrian Rain is a researcher in the field of violence, and he has identified many of the things that I will be talking about further on in this lecture that are biochemical causes of violence. And in the book, he actually ties it into socioeconomic issues as well. I'm not going to be doing that in this lecture, but he does. And it's a very valuable perspective. And then Dr. William Walsh has carried on the work as an orthomolecular researcher of Dr. Pfeiffer and Dr. Hoffer. And this is a fairly complicated book. You need to be a little biochemically aware in order to understand it. And we don't think he has the entire answer to things, but he certainly has a lot of answers. So let's get back to feeding the brain before tweaking the brain. So the old paradigm is going to use medication to tweak the brain. We believe in feeding the brain first and then seeing what's left over. Neurotransmitters 
are the chemicals in our brain that mediate mood and behavior. So all of our feelings, behaviors, and ability to respond to stress are mediated by these chemical families. If they're in balance and functioning properly, so probably are we. But depleted or out of balance neurotransmitters lead to symptoms such as anger, depression, apathy, anxiety, insomnia, cravings for addictive substances and behaviors, and violence. Food is not optional because these neurotransmitters actually require nutrients in order to both be made and to function properly. So these nutrients create neurotransmitters themselves out of amino acids, which come from protein in the presence of vitamins and minerals. They create the enzymes necessary both to make and break down neurotransmitters. We don't want them hanging around too long. They allow for proper transmission of these chemicals. They keep the genes happy, which control all of this, okay? They prevent toxins from disrupting these pathways, and the proper nutrients keep blood sugar stable. So this whole process requires the right nutrients in order to function optimally and beautifully and smoothly. So what's actually needed for this to work? Adequate protein from meat, fish, eggs, milk, but also nuts, beans, and seeds. Specific vitamins and minerals to act as enzymes and cofactors. Essential fatty acids. These include your omega-3s, your phospholipids, such as what's found in egg yolk and legumes, and cholesterol. We'll be looking more at cholesterol in a minute. And then, of course, water. So to prevent nutrient deficiencies, not only do we need adequate food intake, but we also need adequate digestion and absorption. So may, people may be eating enough of the right foods, but if they're not digesting it adequately, for instance, not making enough hydrochloric acid in the stomach, digestive pancreatic enzymes further down in the intestines, food's just going to go right through you in one way or the other, or not go right through you and you get constipated and toxins build up. But it also has to be adequately absorbed, which means that the intestinal wall needs to be happy and healthy. And unfortunately, much of our modern lifestyle destroys the health and happiness of our intestinal wall. Our reliance on antibiotics and other medications, including your over-the-counter anti-inflammatories like aspirin, ibuprofen, etc., can both destroy the integrity of the cell wall or of the intestinal wall, but also disrupt this very wonderful balance that's found in our gut of a multitude of bacteria. We need these good bacteria in our gut, both to keep the intestines happy, the cells happy, but they have a million other roles as well, and they communicate directly to the brain, and the brain can communicate directly to them as well. Well, antibiotics kill them. The antibiotics kill good guys along with the bad guys. And when that happens, it allows other opportunistic bacteria and fungi and yeasty things to grow out of control and they can get into the, the they can both cause inflammation in the intestines that will prevent proper absorption of nutrients they will prevent the digestion of nutrients and they can get into the bloodstream and actually get into the brain and create havoc or the toxins that these bacteria and fungi create will get into the brain and create havoc in mood and behavior. So all of this is important. I'm not gonna spend a ton of time with it, but we need to know that this is happening. Now, how do we know what our clients and parishioners are actually eating? How do we know if they're getting the adequate nutrients? Well, the very first step is to ask them. And those of you who are physicians or clinicians need to start getting into the habit of saying, what did you eat today? What did you eat yesterday? To have a, a, at least a three, if not a three to five day food diary as part of your intake. Even clergy need to know this because if we don't ask, we don't know. Now what I tell, what I do in my own practice and what I 
teach my students to do is that if you have a client who seems unusually dysregulated in a session to actually ask them when was the last time you ate protein and if it was more than three to four hours to feed them so I had a client teddy bear of a guy nicest guy in the world I'd been seeing him oh about four or five months and he had a history of severe bipolar disorder with violence. And I had never seen any indication of this at all. And I taught him all of this, and he was very compliant. And one day he walked into my office radiating this negative, angry, violent energy. And I just wanted to, like, okay, that, that's back up here. And I said, when was the last time you ate protein? And he said, um, I had a really good breakfast. It's now 2 o'clock in the afternoon. He said, I had a really good breakfast about 7 or 8 o'clock in the morning. Then I got really busy, and I did intend to eat lunch. I really did. But, you know, I stood in line here, and then I got into a traffic jam, and, 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 and. He said, okay, okay, I understand. That's fine. Let me feed you. So I fed him, and within 10 minutes, the teddy bear was back. And this intense, pulsating, angry energy was gone. It was just gone like it had never been there. And he looked at me, and he said, oh, my God. I had no idea about the connection. And I think that was the last time he skipped a meal because he did not like how it felt inside. He knew he was on the edge of being out of control. So did I. And he didn't like that feeling. Ten minutes after eating real food, teddy bear was back. Just one simple graph. There's a lot more data out there. But for instance, the median vegetable intake among United States adults in 2011, a while back. Now, vegetables and fruit are where we get our primary vitamins and minerals from, our cofactors and some of our enzymes. There's some states that are really good. California and Oregon are great. Colorado's not bad. But look at the rest of the country. At least half of the country is not getting the necessary vitamins and minerals to allow their brain to work optimally, at least half the country. And then we look at our teenagers. How many teenagers do you know eat protein every four hours, don't eat junk food, get seven to nine servings of fruits and veggies a day? And then we wonder why our teenagers are dying, dying of suicide and killing each other. They're not feeding their brains what their brains require. So Dr. Rain has some very interesting research in his book. I was particularly taken with this one. Prenatal exposure to wartime famine and development of antisocial personality disorder in early adulthood. So antisocial personality disorder is what many violent criminals are diagnosed with. Very, very common diagnosis. It's often attributed to early childhood emotional deprivation. We know there's also some hard wiring involved. Well, this is part of the hard wiring because apparently babies born to mothers who were in a starvation state due to famine end up 20 years later with antisocial personality disorder. That the lack of nutrients they received in utero created a personality disorder. It wasn't just war because in this study, there was war all throughout Holland. It was the part of Holland where there was this horrible pervasive famine that created these adults with antisocial personality disorder. Sorry about the um, poor quality of this. There, it's not 100%, as you can see, there are dots kind of all over the place, but in general, there is a very clear relationship between fish consumption and homicide rates across the world. That the parts of the world that eat more fish have significantly less homicide than the parts of the world, including the United States, that eat less to no fish. Why might this be? In the United States, a study of 3,000 people from Chicago, Minneapolis, and Birmingham showed that those who hardly ever ate fish had higher levels of hostility than those eating fish at least once a week. There are more behavior problems and temper tantrums in boys with lower fatty acid concentration as measured from the blood. The same is true of aggressive cocaine addicts. And even dogs with low levels of omega-3 fatty acids 
have been shown to be more aggressive. So what are omega-3 fatty acids? Well, an essential nutrient is a nutrient that we can only get from food, we cannot make in our bodies itself. And if we don't get any at all of an essential nutrient, we die. And if we don't get enough, something breaks. Well, in the Western world, the consumption of omega-3 fatty acids has dropped by 80% over the last, say, 125 years. Now imagine losing 80% of your income. What's going to break? Well, a lot is going to break. And over the Western world, what has broken is epidemic proportions of major mental illness, bipolar, depression, anxiety, epidemic proportions of inflammatory disorders, such as asthma and arthritis, and epidemic proportions of cognitive disorders, such as dementia and ADHD. And we know that people, children, and adults with ADHD are overrepresented in domestic violence programs DUI programs, addiction programs. And we know that people with ADHD are much more reactive and have much less impulse control, and this can translate into violence. So the omega-3 fatty acids are crucial because they coat every single neuron and they mediate the transmission of the neurotransmitters. They are crucial for proper functioning of the brain. And this is why a lot of our omega-3s come from fish. Not all, but a lot. So if we're eating as a society a whole lot less fish, we're going to have higher levels of aggression. This is a very significant study. The lower your cholesterol is, the more likely you are to be violent. I'm lost. Because what, what's the whole, the whole thing about everybody's trying to lower their cholesterol? And we have too high cholesterol and we can't eat this and don't eat egg and this. I'm all confused. Precisely. So all the cardiologist cares about, all the cardiologist cares about is that you get your cholesterol as low as possible, okay? They don't think about the role that cholesterol has in the rest of the body. See, this is the old paradigm where we cut off pieces of the body and think that they exist sort of you know, on their own with no interconnection with anything else. The reality is, is that cholesterol is also supposed to coat your neuron and that it's also crucial for the production of your reproductive hormones and your adrenal hormones. It's actually the, what all of these hormones are made out of. So if you don't have enough cholesterol, you're not gonna be making enough testosterone, estrogen, progesterone, I think PMS, um, you know, and other things as well. It throws do we have the numbers for that? We, we, do, we, we do have the numbers of it. What they're saying is anything under 140, and I'm probably going to say 150, even 160 in some people, but definitely under 140 of your total cholesterol. In these population studies they've done, the more you go under that number, the higher the rate of suicide and homicide in the community is. And this study has been replicated. But, you know, I, I don't see those numbers even in people who are actually treated for cholesterol. So mm -hmm. I'm just curious. Yeah. I mean, I can't remember the last time I've seen somebody with cholesterol of 140 or 150. Yes. So I had, so I had, a, they, they exist. Yeah, and I don't know the prevalence. What I do know is I have actually both seen clients with very low cholesterol, like around 100, 120, and I've had family members of clients. So I had a female client come in about a month ago complaining about her boyfriend, and he was showing signs of suicidal depression and aggressiveness, and his testosterone was very low. So I said, can we, do you know his cholesterol? And his cholesterol was 125. That's his total? Or his total. And so of course his testosterone was low. And I said, that's a problem. And so we talked about how to raise his cholesterol levels. Pardon? Populations are hanging around 200 and 200 and above. Mm -hmm. And so it's a total majority sure. of the population. Well, yeah, I mean, most of the population has higher cholesterol to the point that we forget to think about the other side. We forget to look at it and we sort of say, oh, low cholesterol, that's nice, right? 
We don't say low cholesterol, very low cholesterol. Oh, maybe there's a correlation between the very low cholesterol and their mental health issues. Uh, I think the applicability of this could be like when you are in cholesterol and the uh, suppression of the level of cholesterol. Mm -hmm. You need to be careful how low you go yeah. because they keep giving you statins. They keep giving you statins. Statins, which have multiple side effects. So once you reach the level that you're supposed to reach, I mean, you should to the level so you're not exactly. Down. Yeah, you don't want to. No, no. We don't. Uh, we weren't able to figure out why his cholesterol was so low, and I've now, you know, um, haven't heard from that client for a little bit because I pulled back from my practice in the process of my move. But um, we we need to just be aware of this. And be aware that cardiologists don't have this information, and so all they care about is just the lower the better. And then there's the whole argument is maybe cholesterol is not the problem it's made out to be for heart disease anyway, but that's a completely different conversation. Now, I talked earlier about neurotransmitters and how neurotransmitters are the chemicals in the brain that mediate mood. And I talk a lot about neurotransmitters in the classes I teach and in addiction recovery and relapse prevention. But here's just one study that shows that low serotonin from tryptophan deficiency can lead to violence. So tryptophan is one of the amino acids from food that gets turned in the brain into serotonin. Serotonin is one of our major neurotransmitter systems that mediates mood, and it's our mellow chemical. Okay, when we have enough serotonin, we can flow, we're happy, we're flexible, we can let go, we can forgive, we have sort of access to our uh, coping skills. Okay, but when serotonin is low, one of the symptoms is irritability all the way to violence. And so this is one study that shows, or several, that shows that animals fed diets reduced in tryptophan become aggressive, while high tryptophan foods reduce their aggression. When tryptophan is experimentally reduced in men, supposed to be in men, and women, they respond more aggressively when provoked. And when tryptophan is enhanced, aggressive behavior is reduced. I'm sorry to ask, but what's tryptophan? Tryptophan is an amino acid found in food that the brain makes serotonin out of. And I don't know if you've heard of 5-HTP. We can now buy 5-HTP over the counter as well as tryptophan. And it's found in large quantities in a South African plant called Griffonia. In the body, the tryptophan we eat turns into 5-HTP, turns into serotonin which then turns into melatonin to help us sleep. So the, the, there are some essential amino acids which are not for, uh, could be able to ability to be created by the body. And the only way you can get them is through nutrition, and tryptophan is one of them. Mm -hmm. So if you don't get that from nutrition, then you're not going to have the substrate for the rest of the components that are required, uh, such as serotonin. That's why they are called essential amino acids. Mm -hmm. Just like, you know, the omega-3s are an essential nutrient, so is tryptophan, tyrosine, some others that the body makes its neurotransmitters out of in the presence of vitamins and minerals. And, and I'm just giving you guys the tippy tip on this because we only have an hour. But I actually um, have an online school where I teach all of this to practitioners in great detail. But some things even more scary is that psychotropic meds may deplete nutrients. We know that some research indicates the meds themselves may increase antisocial or violent behavior, and it's because they actually use up nutrients to do their job. And if we're not replacing these nutrients either by diet or a supplement, we become even more depleted. This is also true for women on oral contraceptives. And so since all of these nutrients are required for the creation of our neurotransmitters, if we're deficient in any of these neurotransmitters, or sorry, any of these vitamins or minerals, we're, we can't make sufficient neurotransmitters. It's like the body looks at the available store of nutrients and it says, okay, we don't have enough. We don't have enough for the whole city. So we're gonna, we're gonna use what's here to just keep the city alive.
to just keep the body alive, to keep the heart pumping, to keep the lungs working, to keep digestion more or less going, right? To keep blood flowing. The brain, well, we want to keep the brain alive, but we don't care so much about mood. We want to keep the heart beating, okay? So if there's not enough amino acids and nutrients to go around, our neurotransmitters appear to be the ones taking the hit, and we end up with mood and behavioral disorders may stay alive, but we're not very happy, and we're generally not treating the people around us very well either, so they're not very happy. Try asking them, especially if you like run a DUI group or an addiction group or a domestic violence group, what they had for breakfast. Now, 10 years ago in these groups, most people would answer Mountain Dew or Coke. Now you've got more of these monsters thrown in. Okay, and I know people who really eat nothing but Mountain Dew all day and then wonder why they can't work and they're in a domestic violence group and they're in a DUI group and, and, and. So now we get to blood sugar control. We know that sugar and carbohydrate consumption in the Western world and actually the Eastern world too is pretty astronomical. A hundred, some stats say that between 150 to 170 pounds of sugar per person consumed annually. Okay, this is equal to six cups a week, which is essentially one cup of sugar a day. The American Health Association recommends no more than about a third of a cup a day of sugar. Okay, most people significantly exceed this. We know that refined carbohydrates are themselves addictive. They fire the same neurotransmitters that cocaine does, that heroin does, etc. And in fact, they've done some studies with rats where they fed rats a high sugar diet and then abruptly withdrew them from sugar. These rats had opiate withdrawal symptoms. Okay, their little forepaws trembled and their teeth chattered. Okay, this is apparently in rats, opiate withdrawal symptoms. Well, they had the same symptoms when the sugar was taken away. So we know that sugar is an addictive drug and we know that many addicts in um, early recovery switch addictions to sugar. Most treatment programs out there, fortunately not all, but many treatment programs out there allow their clients unlimited access to sugar. So I had, I went to an AA meeting in a treatment program a little bit ago. And while we were waiting to go into the room where the meeting was to be held, the big waiting room, and there was a huge bowl of candy on the table. It was overflowing with candy. By the end of the meeting, that bowl was empty. Let's see what sugar does. It contributes to violence, depression, anxiety, and then obesity, cancer, and diabetes. We know that. But anxiety, depression, violence, reactive hypoglycemia. Reactive hypoglycemia is a medical disorder, medically diagnosed. You know, we can throw the term hypoglycemia around all the time, and I do, but there are actually medical criteria for it. It's rampant in the American population, commonly underdiagnosed because it's not tested for. It's a direct result of what we're calling the standard American diet, which is very high in carbohydrate and very low in everything else, causes many of the symptoms in our clients, is a major cause of impulsive violence, post-acute withdrawal, PMS, and cravings. And it appears to be the primary relapse trigger for all addiction because of what happens in the prefrontal cortex when you either miss a meal or you eat a high sugar meal. And I have a whole hour and a half lecture on this. But um, this is what happens. So here's what's supposed to happen. You wake up in the morning and your blood sugar's at baseline, hopefully not too high baseline. And you eat real food, or even if you have normal blood sugar metabolism, you can even eat a high sugar food and it will be okay. Your blood sugar rises gradually and the brain says, okay, this is good, but now this secrete tells the pancreas to secrete some insulin, which takes the sugar, knocks on the nearest muscle cell, says, hi, I'm insulin, I got some sugar for you, you want it? You want it? And the cell's supposed to say, yes, of course. Let me use it, let me store it, and my job to take it from you. And blood sugar and insulin gradually drop down to baseline, and some people this could be a four hour process, some people it could be six or even eight hours if you know they're really healthy. People with reactive hypoglycemia the very different thing that happens. 
So let me show you. In this graph, this middle line, the baseline, that's what I was just talking about. That's normal blood sugar control. So everybody here, right, all five people were given the same amount of sugar at the beginning of the test. Notice the difference that happens within the first 30 to 60 minutes. This is 30 minutes, by the way, 60 minutes, of taking your sugar. Very profound differences in these different people with these different biochemistries. What we're concerned about, the red line on top is diabetes. It starts higher, goes higher, stays higher. The green line is reactive hypoglycemia. And the diagnosis, medical diagnosis, and those doctors in the room correct me if I'm wrong, is that it has to get down to more or less 50 to be diagnosed as hypoglycemia goes up almost to diabetic levels, hangs there for a little bit, and the brain says, oh no, blood sugar going way too high, way too fast, do something. And the pancreas now secretes too much insulin. And in diabetes, the, in, the pancreas may be secreting too much insulin, but the cell is saying, go away. Go away, I don't want any more sugar. Right? And so blood sugar keeps rising. But in reactive hypoglycemia, the opposite happens. There's an overproduction of insulin, leading to a dramatic drop in blood sugar levels. And now let's, let's look at this. What happens? See how the green line goes back up again? Okay, these people didn't eat any more sugar. The brain said, oh no, blood sugar now dropping way too fast, way too low. This person can die. Let's do something. And now adrenaline kicks in. The adrenals release adrenaline because adrenaline can release stored sugar back into the bloodstream. So you see how it rises there and then gradually goes back down. Well, adrenaline here is the culprit. It's the perpetrator because adrenaline diminishes executive functioning. What do I mean by that? Well, the prefrontal cortex is responsible for our executive functioning the ability to make decisions, think through consequences. You have a question? No. Oh, OK. I'm, I'm with you. I'm yeah. Just... Um, think through consequences, access and utilize skills, empathize, slow down. OK? That's what the prefrontal cortex does. Now, adrenaline diminishes executive functioning. Adrenaline activates the sympathetic nervous system, which activates the primitive parts of our brain, which are reactive. And to use the vernacular, the addict lives in the primitive part of the brain. And so when we're under the influence of adrenaline, our prefrontal cortex, where we have our recovery skills, our slow down and breathe skills, our communication skills, goes offline. We, don't, we may not even have access to them. The reactive part of our brain is activated, and this increases reactivity, anger, and rage, and promotes violence. So my husband, several years ago, had a parishioner come to him whose wife was about to divorce him because every night he came home from work and threw a fit. He didn't hit people, but he threw objects. He put holes in walls. He screamed and yelled and basically acted terrifying. She had two teenage sons, and she didn't want her sons exposed to this anymore. So the very first thing that Father Jan asked was, what did you eat today? Turns out that the guy had something like two cups of coffee for breakfast with a couple of teaspoons of sugar in his coffee, maybe a donut, and not much better for lunch, had a candy bar on his way home from work. He was running on adrenaline. He had a starving brain. So all somebody had to do was look at him sideways, and he blew. So the first intervention that Father Jan did was, you know, eat protein every four hours. The guy came back the next week astonished because his rage had completely evaporated. He was the nicest person in the world. You know, he had protein for breakfast, protein for lunch, a protein bar on his way home from work rather than the candy bar, and then the real dinner. And he could cope 
with stress. Now he had to repair his family. I'm going to go through this pretty quickly. For those of you who work with addiction, I pull statistics from a treatment program that does a four-hour glucose tolerance test on all of its residents. 98% of them had medically diagnosable hypoglycemia. Think about the implications of it for your addicted clients. Race through this. What about fasting? We can, have, we can fast healthily, or we can fast really stupidly. This one um, parishioner of my husband's, he did great until the fast came, and then he reverted back to his old eating and immediately became violent again. There are other considerations here that we need to bear in mind. Traumatic brain injury is a huge cause of violent and out of control behavior, and it can come in very young children who fall off a bicycle or, you know, learning to ride and hit something. Or my daughter, who I wasn't there, apparently was sledding, hit a bump and flew off the sleigh and landed on her head. Didn't have any noticeable symptoms, except that her ADD, all of a sudden, she started having ADD symptoms. And when we had a brain scan, the um, technician said, did you have a brain injury? I didn't know about this. Um, and she and dad remembered when she flew off the sleigh. So these are things that you know we may not easily remember, but can impact brain functioning and cause all sorts of symptoms. And then other considerations, food allergies and intolerances. For those of you who are more biochemically minded under methylation, heavy metal toxicity. I really like this one. At least 15 studies around the world link high manganese levels in workers to violence and irrationality to the point that in Chile, there's a term for this, lucura manganita, manganese madness. How often do we think about our clients or our parishioners who work in factories, who work around toxic chemicals? and how it might be affecting their mood and behavior. Pyroluria is a genetic disorder that can lead to violence and low lithium. So I will stop here. I invite all of you to take my class so you can learn much more about this. Any questions or comments before we stop? That was, very, that was excellent, thank you. Um, my question is the use of 5-HTP Yes. Um, in patients with SSRIs? Because uh, with tryptophan, you can get a serotonin syndrome. But well, 5-HTP as well. You can use it. You have to know what you're doing. You have to be really careful. You want to use it six hours apart. And you want to be sure that the low serotonin symptoms in somebody on an SSRI are actually due to not enough serotonin in the system for the drug to work on versus the person's already on the edge of serotonin syndrome and their symptoms are actually coming from too much medication rather than too little. Other questions? All right. Where do we find your, um, your online program? Um, so the name of the company is the Academy for Addiction and Mental Health Nutrition. And I meant to bring my brochures along, but I think they got packed. Uh, <laughs> the Academy for Addiction and Mental Health Nutrition. You should be able to Google it. The actual URL is addictionnutritionacademy.com. And I'm also available to speak to, you know, clinics. Um, I do online mental health nutrition so I'm happy to consult with you or any of your clients online once I move. I'll be working again by around December, the beginning of December. Can yes. I, mm -hmm. yeah. I don't know if I need this, but um, do you tar is your target audience the um, psychologist, psychiatrist, or do you also work with um, um, internal medicine? Because I see that there's a disconnect. Yes. You do work with internal medicine. Mm -hmm. And do you find that they are in basically in the know of these things, or are they foreign to you? Because it seems like there is a tension between the internal medicine and those that have addiction signs. And they um, oh, yes. seem to belittle or underestimate or overestimate estimate what is possible for the patient. And 
I'm just wondering if that's um, something we're addressing. Is that, is that one consideration? I'm addressing it. I don't think very many other people are, but a couple of years ago, I had a nephrologist, a kidney doctor, take my course, both the beginning and my advanced course, because she was in the Institute for Functional Medicine and her husband was starting a treatment program. So she wanted to learn all this information. And as she made her way through my advanced course, she thanked me because the way I was presenting all this information allowed her to make sense of her functional medical training. So she was a kidney doctor. But yes, there's a huge disconnect. And do you, do you see that there's a role for education in the realm of the doctors, or is it just now in medical school? Like, how do we keep the internal medicine up to speed with this? Mickey, can I have you answer that question? I'm sorry if that's too broad, but I'm very curious. No, it's a very important question. I just want a doctor it, to answer it. Well, you know, it, um, in medical school, I think uh, one of the statistics where we get like less than a day's worth of nutritional uh, training, I mean, which mm -hmm. is crazy uh, when you think yep, about it. Yep, nurses too. And even as, even as physicians, you know, I transitioned over into a functional medicine practice from emergency medicine. So. Um, I'm seeing more and more physicians see the correlation between nutrition. I mean, all you have to do is look at the microbiome, um, and uh, there's uh, you know pounds and pounds of bacteria in your gut, and the balance of those bacteria. For example, we were talking early, uh, earlier about the uh, toxins released in your bloodstream. Um, you know, it's called one of the main toxins released by gram-negative bacteria is called lipopolysaccharides. <laughs> And they float through your bloodstream. And, Nasty little critters. And and they literally will penetrate your brain and uh, cause <laughs> brain inflammation. Or, quite frankly, it's probably low grade encephalitis. And so now you have this. Uh, let's say, for example, if you had this uh, kid, and the kid wakes up in the morning, he's got, a, you know, he was a C-section, so he's never been inoculated with the proper bacteria. And so then now he's, uh, you know, in three practices a, a week, uh, you know, um, soccer. And then, of course, mom takes him to McDonald's for dinner because they're too busy. Then in the morning he wakes up and he's very busy. He has a bagel on his way into school. So then all he has is a high glycemic food. He gets, you know, he gets then hypoglycemic around 10 in the morning. Of course, the teacher's doing the same thing. And next thing you know, the kid's nervous and shaking at 10 o'clock. What's the first thing the teacher says? we got to put this kid on a drug. So, and I could go on, there's a vicious cycle this whole thing, and then they take him to the pediatrician, pediatrician puts him on any, you know, on something, some, some Adderall or something. I suppose that um, the proliferation of not asking the right questions hmm. of the disciplines in, in medical science across the board, it, it just, as an elder now, an old wo older woman, versus young. I remember medicine, when going to doctors, they would ask very probing questions on all levels. And now, if you go to a specialist, which everybody does, you go to the cardiologist, and they ask questions. And like you said, it's all about the heart. And then you go somewhere else, and then you find out from a different doctor, you have a diagnosis, and then the original one that you went to that didn't probably ask the right question says, well, why didn't you tell me that? And why I bring it up is, what, even in the church, are we modeling to ask the right questions? And how, and how can we, as also theologians in our life, mm -hmm. and, and um, you know, witnesses to Christ, how do we integrate those two things? I think they've become so, just this dichotomy of academics and then the spiritual world, and their they go hand in hand, like you said, you know, mm -hmm. for the brain. And I don't see us asking probing questions of the patient to also um, help and participate in their healing and their understanding. So how do we address that, and are we? We're not. And the answer to how is here I am, and here you guys are and we're engaging in dialogue, and we're learning from each other, and we're meeting each other. <clears throat> and as we meet each other, and as we engage in dialogue, and as we write these things down, and as we do podcasts, 
little by little by little, we get this information out there. It, it, there, there's actually this sort of tidal wave that's beginning to happen. It's very different from it was 10 years ago or even 30 years ago when I first started learning about all of this. I, I used to go to, still do, go to addiction conferences. And it would be me with my table teaching this stuff and them, <laughs> all the conventional addiction people, okay? And they would look at me and I would smile wave. <laughs> <laughs> and I taught, this very good friend of mine now was part of them. And she remembers that I spoke at a very conventional treatment program about 10 years ago. And they all thought I was nuts. Mm -hmm. And she was kind of intrigued, but you know. And then she became ill, started going to functional medical doctors, and started talking to me. And I said, hey, I'll give you my course for free. So she took my courses, was completely blown away, and is now acting as a bridge between them and me to the point that the, the gap is being bridged. And she came to a going away party that people gave for me a week ago. We had a wonderful conversation because she was saying she's pretty influential in the national addiction world. And she was saying that she's running across more and more and more treatment providers who want, who want the wellness model. Mm -hmm. Because the old model, the old paradigm, is killing people. <coughs> yes? Yeah, I, I, that's what I was going to get at. It's like, you know, I mean, you ask, you know, some of your questions, I mean, very valid. But here's the thing, you know, as a clinician, there's only really so many things you can screen for in 15 minutes. We're expected to, you know, fall risk, this risk, that risk, you know. You feel safe at home. Right. You, you're safe at home. Do you have a gun at home? Do you have this at home? You know, as clinicians, we're asked to do an incessant amount of things. You know what I mean? Yeah, the model doesn't work. Yeah, you know, and so yeah, when so we have to... But when we have to do it in 15 minutes, I mean, there's no way we're able I to do that. I agree with you, even with the patient. I, I walk away yeah. and you, you, you lay down whatever it is, $200 or something, and, you know, it's like, oh, they didn't ask me that. I forgot to tell them this, but they got this information and stuff that really doesn't matter. It's like checking off a list. And it, and don't, I don't go find yourself a functional medical doctor. Yeah, it's, it's, you it's can one Google of those. Functional medicine. Yeah. You can go to the website of IFM, which is the Institute for Functional Medicine. So or it's, functional so it's medicine not that university. clinicians don't want to do or those things. Or talk to this gentleman right here. It's just like very limiting. You know, it's kind of limiting. It's only so much you can kind of do with a lot of the things, the time and the resource that you're provided to do. Depends on whether or not you want to get paid. Yeah. Now, well, that's a good point. And you may sound think that this is, doesn't make sense in the conversation, but I propose that it does. So how do we also, as, um, not me, I'm not a doctor, I'm a, I'm a nothing, I'm not a lay person here, but anyway, but what about um, all, all you folks that are educated in this and the physicians, is there any way that we can um, call out to the heads of our church, I mean, even if it's to the Patriarch or something, because I just heard not too long ago, uh, what I'm going to call, God forgive me, kind of a wicked sermon, and that is about, you know, how the devil has captured those who um, are addicted. And maybe initially there's culpability and sin, not maybe, there is, okay, but at some point it's the disease, and the disease is, is manifesting, and the disease is talking, and we're still preaching, you know, you fell into the devil's hand. So I would just suggest, you know, having had that when I went to seminary, I would just suggest that it would be important for your discipline to educate in a very loving way, obviously, some of the hierarchical people who are a little bit different road and then in only Satan's, uh, you know, dirty duty. So there is both. There yeah. is, and guess what? You get to write the letter. <laughs> you get to write the letter. I'll do it on one condition. Okay. You all read it and at least verify what, what I'm saying.
saying in a coherent way, no? No, it doesn't have to. Because you get to speak up. Exactly. We are speaking. You are. It starts one person. It starts one person? Yeah. I'm up here already speaking. My lecture is going to be in that little book. I'm totally serious about it. You get to write the letter because you're the one. You're the one in the trenches. Well, so are we. But you see, you're also in the trenches. So your perception also matters. Yeah, and as the family members have so much fallout with those that have the d different addictions, it's uh, what about how do we suffer for them? You know, that's a huge part of it. Uh, who gets I'm going to be, in my retirement here, I'm going to be writing a book for family members. 